Hello everybody and welcome to another show of Revit Pure Live. I am Nicolas Quetelier, an architect, BIM manager, educator and founder of the website RevitPure.com. I live in Quebec City, Canada. Revit Pure Live is a show where we help you become a better Revit user. Sometimes the show is done by myself, but sometimes uh, BIM specialists come on the show to keep things interesting, like today. As always, use the chat to ask any question you might have. Uh, quickly, before we get going, uh, Revit 2022 has been released. So go to RevitPR.com. You can go to the blog section. We've created uh, a big post called Top 10 Best New Features in Revit 2022, where we go around all the exciting new stuff in the new release. And we've also created um, a special pamphlet, a special premium pamphlet. Just let me find the link. There you go. At revitpure.com slash revit2022. Uh, it's a 86 pages pamphlet PDF and a 52 minutes video where we go through the whole thing, explain all the features, not only a summary, but strategy and tips to integrate um, the new features in your workflows and your template. <clears throat> so that's for Revit 2022, and I'm ready to announce the next guest, which will be next week, Revit Pure Live, episode eight, uh, with Michael Kilkelly, known for his great website, Art Smarter. Uh, Michael is known for automation with Revit. Uh, he's an expert in language such, such as C Sharp and Dynamo. He's created multiple plugins, and he'll actually be there next week to help you create your first adding using C Sharp. So it's going to be uh, next Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern time. There's no link yet, but it should be ready within a couple of days. So put that on your agenda. All right. <clears throat> so today's guest is Gavin Crump. Gavin is based in Sydney, Australia, where it is currently 9 a.m. That means Gavin is probably sipping his coffee while it is the evening here in Quebec City, and which means I'm about to open the cold beer and enjoy uh, Gavin speaking while he's starting his day. Uh, Gavin worked as a BIM manager for multiple architecture firms in Sydney before starting his own YouTube channel called Aussie BIM Guru in March 2019. Gavin became a full a full time self employed BIM consultant in January 2020. He has published more than 250 videos on his channel, where he's followed by more than 15,000 subscribers. He's an expert in Dynamo and even published his own Dynamo nodes package called Crumple. Crumple. So <laughs> welcome to the show, Gavin. How is it going? Uh, hi there, Nicholas. Um, thanks for having me on the show. It, it's great. It's a lovely day today. Mm -hmm. um, not nice and hot down under as always. Um, I've, I've had my coffee and I feel great. Yeah, yeah all right. I say in Pokemon. Um, but um, but uh, it doesn't mean we don't always have a beer in the morning sometimes as well in oh, Australia. Okay. We, we do like our beer here as well. So so a morning beer is usually the go on the weekend. Morning beer, all right. <laughs> I guess. Yeah, I, usually and I must right. say before we jump in, um, congrats on your 2022 pamphlets. That that's an amazing effort. Uh, like 80, 80 plus pages. Um, yeah, on, on I, release. I, I <laughs> went into a rampage because uh, basically I was busy yeah. until early uh, last week, and I realized, oh my god, there's so much stuff. So I, I it's quite a lot. I, yeah, I, went I mean, to, yeah, I went oops. kind of a berserk mode to try to create content in time for the release. Mm, I almost uh, go back to 2021 and I'm like, the wall slanted and what else happened? I can't remember now. Yes, <laughs> so well, yeah, many new things in 2022. <laughs> yeah, in 2020, yeah, there was not much yet. So it, mm. yeah, I, I guess it's, it's exciting, uh, so you've been talking about that on, on your uh, blog too, the, the yeah, open letters. Yeah, so I think that my own that almost certainly down list. Effect, right? Mm. Yeah, yeah. So I had a video on Revit and also on Dynamo, and next week I'll be covering um, how you can do floors and ceilings with holes in them in Dynamo, which is mm -hmm. um, which is quite new, um, and also how you can do an ISO nineteen six fifty uh, BIM management compliant uh, revisioning system um, to yeah, comply yeah. with the, the P and the C revisioning systems, which I know a lot of countries still aren't using. Um, but yeah. I guess is, the is UK it, is. is um, yeah, is it common in Australia yeah. to use this standard? 
It depends on which departments you work with. Um, if you work with our transport department, for example, on rail projects, um, they okay. are um, becoming more closely aligned with the um, the PASS or the ISO standards now. Um, I, I worked on a few projects um, probably about two years ago where they were just starting to implement the system and Revit definitely struggled to, mm -hmm. to capture the revisioning system. We actually used to use the issued by and the issued to field yeah, as the I've revision number to, to trick it. It was, it was I've absolutely awful. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm so glad to see that they, they listened to the, um, to at least part of the letter there and <laughs> made our life a little bit easier in that regard. Um, and, and I guess now we can put holes in slanted walls too. Ooh. <laughs> yeah, and now that so you, they, they you, took that feature and improved it as well. So. Yeah, now that you mentioned uh, that, I didn't think about mm -hmm. it. But when creating uh, directives for uh, mm -hmm. the, the, the field work, I used to use the issued by fields instead of the, yep. the, the real numbering uh, mm. system. So you had to use workarounds. <laughs> so just that's no, great. Now, I guess you can prefix and suffix in numerical system, so you've got mm -hmm. full flexibility now, which is great, and you can make as many many series as you want. So, um, so yeah, it's definitely going to be a big, a big improvement One, once we can actually get to Revit twenty twenty two. That's the new challenge now that um, we're all probably still working on projects back in twenty twenty and yeah, prior, sure. prior. So, getting to that version is now the now, so now the goal, I guess. That's, uh, yeah. How is it usually for you? Do people wait like uh, usually it's the first service back? That's yeah. the optimistic point of view, like for those who are mm, quick. Yeah, it used to be service pack two, I guess, used to be the common approach that people used to take. But now that the cloud's around and the Autodesk app makes it easier to manage those processes, we tend to tend to usually go with update one. Um, mm -hmm. I think too as well that maybe maybe the, the, the features are a bit more robustly tested, I think, on release now than maybe they used to be. So SP1 used to be quite unpredictable when you could have corruptions and mm -hmm. it seems like it's pretty rare for that to happen now. I think when you're working with a cloud distribution model, you can't really afford to um, have you know things go too badly. So um, And I think that the private beta Revit program, that seems to really help them. Yeah, uh, yeah, I guess stay on target as well. So that's probably helped them them um, bypass that. Um, but in terms of versioning, like we tend to leapfrog over the odd numbers and stick with the even numbers. That seems to be the general. Yeah, approach. I've heard like, that a lot. I'd, I'd be quite happy just to see Revit released every every two years with double the features. To be honest, the way the way it goes. But um, mm -hmm. just just to, and also just to make it easier to reach the versions in time because um, otherwise the projects tend to lag behind. Because I guess projects go for like six seven years sometimes and you know mm -hmm. there's usually the policy of either no upgrade or upgrade like with care um with the whole team at the same time which is usually quite challenging so i find that mostly projects tend to stay back in their um in their starting version at least at whatever point they reached when they got past the development application process mm -hmm. that seems to be the the line in the sand that's quite difficult to cross um, yeah, sure. But I guess um, when one hour has been managing before I consulted, I did try to keep projects up to date, but it was a big challenge when every day you're winning new work and, you know, projects are just compounding every time and mm -hmm. not many people want to go and do the upgrades because it's quite a boring process. <laughs> yeah, sure. So, um, yeah. It's, it's, and I guess maintaining separate content libraries, there's all sorts of nightmares involved beyond just the projects themselves. So you've got to sort of commit to your your lowest content library version that you can work with and then just upgrade them as you use them instead of um, maintaining like three different libraries at the same time. Mm. Yeah, so mm. what was your uh, favorite features? I don't remember from your video. Mine uh, was the, the, the revisions. The, the yeah. revisions, okay, yeah. I think that was my highlight, but I must say like um, the, the Dynamo floor and ceilings is, is a mm. big one um, because we used to be able to sort of automate the setup of a building, but we couldn't automate the ceilings and we couldn't put holes in the floors. So if you had like a, a tower project with an ele elevator core running through the middle mm -hmm. um, and you wanted to generate floors, the floor would go through the core or you'd have to put a floor opening inside that hole in the floor, which is a pretty bad workaround because yeah, yeah. It, it's an element that people essentially don't know is there. Mm -hmm. um, that isn't really easily controlled at the sketch level. Um, so they're probably really big features in terms of automating building setup. Um, so yeah. I think they're probably my, my favorite Dynamo related feature. Um, yeah, sure. I did but hear some people said they were able to do holes in floors before. So I don't know if maybe there was a way around it mm -hmm. uh, and maybe it's just a new Dynamo feature, but my understanding was it was an API um, upgrade as well. So so um, yeah, that, that, that's probably the one that excites me the most, but probably the revisioning upgrade excites me not just because of what it is, but what it represents in that now it's probably Autodesk listening a little bit more to what we as the industry need in reality out of this platform, mm -hmm. um, which maybe wasn't always the focus of the updates in the past. So it makes me also think we're hopefully going to see some things like um, more easy IFC data mapping out of files. That's one mm -hmm. thing I'm really pushing them at. Anytime anyone from Autodesk asks me, what do you want? I say, give me easy IFC mapping. Don't give me those parameter mapping files that only the experts understand. Give me like an app or an integration or something 
where you just line up fields to fields and sort of like the interoperability tools, that sort of that sort of logic, um, because mm-hmm. that, that, that's probably the next frontier that Revit's really going to struggle to to satisfy people with, I think, and that you can't just go export IFC and pass it over to Mr. or Mrs. Archicad because they're going to go, well, this, this IFC is terrible. There's no data in it or, the, or there's too much data that doesn't match my schema. So, yeah, yeah. so I think um, it's a good sign that hopefully we'll see some more focused with things like that. Um, there's, there's someone from Autodesk that actually just started a series on IFC and Revit, which is great. It's a channel called um, Bim Me Up. Um, so if Bim anyone's a Star up. Trek oh, fan, they'll probably get the reference. I'll have to ch- um, check so, this out. Um, yeah, so definitely worth checking that out. Um, but that, that at least shows how you can do it right now. Mm-hmm. Um, but it definitely needs to be simplified for the average average user, which we, as we know, they're, they're probably not even aware of the IFC schema typically. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I'll, I'll be asking people in the chat, what was your uh, favorite new features and your new release? So everybody seems to have a different one. I'm curious to hear for those who had the chance to look at the new features, uh, type that in the chat. Uh, something else I wanted to ask you. So you've been... Uh, <laughs> Is, was it the uh, last year or early the you you've become a, a full-time yeah, consultant doing awesome. your own thing yeah so how has that been um, doing yeah sorry so um so i guess um i, I decided at the end of like 2019 not quite the end actually probably closer to the middle but really put <coughs> into motion at the end of 2019 started setting up my business um finished my, my role as a bin mm-hmm. manager um, uh, the, the company I worked at, I was having a great time at. I just really felt like I wanted to reach more companies than just just mine because I, I began YouTube in 20, March of 2019, and so I really started to get an appetite for helping people outside the domain of the company. And I could see some some intellectual property issues were going to arise if I touched on various topics whilst working at a company that's probably doing a lot of those things as well. So I did realize too that I was I was already quite limited by. By just that that nature of working in a company, so that that sort of drove my decision to launch my own business, um, where I can consult to people. And I, and I must say, YouTube was amazing for um, generating leads. Like most, mm-hmm. I still haven't done any cold calling as a consultant, um, which, mm-hmm. which is really really nice. Um, everyone comes to me, which is really welcoming. Um, but yeah. I also, um, I you, guess you don't have to spam people on LinkedIn. Too. Yeah, yeah, I don't have to. Go hey, yeah, I'm doing uh, outsourcing. <laughs> you need my services. Uh, I do get a lot of those, but yeah, I don't send them too. myself. So probably about five a day at the moment, which is crazy. Probably only respond to one, block two, and ignore two. <laughs> um, but but anyway, so I, so I, I've been working yeah pretty much as a consultant since um, I really got into motion probably in the middle of 2020. Um, before that, I was really working on building my own Revit content standard that I launched on my online store, mm-hmm. um, which has also been a really great lead for generating work because people come purchase my standard and. Essentially, once they're templated to my system, they go, oh, we actually want the architect behind the system as well to mm-hmm. help us out. Um, so I'll be launching a course platform quite shortly as well, which will contain that content in a live format so that they can receive live updates if I make any modifications to it. Mm-hmm. Whereas originally my Wix store was quite static and once you downloaded it, that was it. Um, mm-hmm. and, and eventually online courses will come on there as well, but I'll keep doing the YouTube as well. So I've got a few a few avenues keeping me busy. Um, I've started sub-consulting recently. Um, for a, a large architectural firm as a, as a computational leader there as well. So um, that's been keeping me quite busy and actually has given me a lot of um, context in what I'll be showing today and how Rhino Inside can really support Revit and Rhino workflows because they're quite quite heavy users of both platforms. Um, and I, I've also been teaching university um, yeah, for a few that. days this, so this, how this has semester it been doing? as well, which is, which is great. So um, mm-hmm. a nice way to sort of reach a different sort of audience mm-hmm. yeah, and, sure, and yeah. in a different context. Yeah, um, I've been doing that too in, uh, in college. It just, it lasts okay. uh, for six weeks, uh, hmm. but it's, uh, yeah, it's fun to chat with uh, people. Yeah, it's been great to get different perspectives, but also um, it's given me a way to sort of make sure that my knowledge was sound as well, because when mm-hmm. I built the curriculum, I had to make mm-hmm. sure that, you know, I was teaching them everything that was true and correct. And even I found some assumptions I had on things like IFC mm-hmm. and open standards that I had to sort of correct my own uh, perspectives on as well, so that I could teach them, you know, what is true and correct and what they needed. So it's been a good way to, mm-hmm. to reinforce my own my own knowledge as well, but also just to share it um, to people that are about to go right out into the workplace and apply it. So um the, 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 I feel bad for the students. Their heads are probably too full of knowledge right now. I've been mm-hmm. throwing as much knowledge as I can at them, but um, I think they're really enjoying it. And um, yeah, it's great. So um, so all those avenues just sort of come together to somehow um, you know balance with the social life and, <laughs> and a life and all yeah, sure. Things. Well, I, I've just started a month ago being a uh, full time as mm. a kind of a BIM teacher, practitioner, consultant. 
Oh, and okay. Of, hopefully, at some point, doing some uh, architecture design work as well. Congratulations! Uh, That's a it's, it's a big move. So you're it, essentially it self-writing as a consultant as well. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, exactly. Ooh, uh, okay. And so I'm trying to split my time 50-50 between creating content online and like online mm -hmm. courses and doing some consulting. But like, yeah, I'm already kind of booked out of, <laughs> of consulting. Yeah, it fills up very yeah, fast. It does, I'll yeah. say. I mean, even even this week, I think. Which is um, a good problem, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's it's always good to have too much work. Um, but I guess I, I think on Monday my my next three weeks filled out in one day, and I was like, oh, I haven't got any work next week, and suddenly I had two weeks over the top of it, and I was like, oh no, I've got university in week three, and it's it's, it's a juggling act at that point. But it's it's um it's good fun. I think it teaches me a lot about time management, um uh, as well. That's one great thing. Working inside yeah. a firm doesn't always give you the best time management skills because you're surrounded by people that don't necessarily have mm. the best time management skills, so you sort of suffer. Yeah, yeah from other people's habits. So I think being a sole trader, you'll, you'll really enjoy um, that experience to get to, to know thyself a bit better as well and sort of figure yeah, out. Yeah, sure. Because, because I started well. Revit so, um, Pure in 2016. So for all these years, for yeah. five years, I was doing this, you know, in addition to my day job. Mm, and so, it, you know, I have two daughters now and I was getting to a point where it's too much. Yeah, yeah but, I guess I don't have any kids to juggle I, yet. So I yeah, really yeah. So I just could get myself... Family. I'm just gonna get myself yeah. to leave my job because I I kind of liked it. I kind of like being an architect, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. at some point, you know, Revit Pure was getting too big, and also I have so much ideas about it that I wanted to push mm -hmm. forward, but not enough time, and it was kind of driving me crazy. So yeah, I, well, I there's a really great quote I like, and I think it's something like you can either spend your whole life building mm -hmm. on building your dreams or someone else's or something yeah, like that. Exactly, think, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, it's it's great to follow that that mm -hmm. pathway. Uh, and for anyone thinking about being a consultant too, um, it's a great path. But mm -hmm. I guess just make sure that you've got the the backing behind you, um, not only from the client perspective mm -hmm. and from knowing that you will have people that want to work with you, but also just from a an emotional support perspective. Make sure you have people that are behind you as well. Mm -hmm. That that's been pretty cool to making that happen. I mean, you've got your family. I'm sure that's going to be a huge part of that support network for you, but also you've got your peers and people you've worked with. And, and yeah, without sure. that, it's pretty much impossible to do it. I've seen a lot of people try and try and I wouldn't say fail, but try and give try and, uh, try and give up because of that. They've, they've lacked that support network. Um, yeah, and, and sure. It's, it, it pays well too. I mean, that's the other thing too. It's uh, that, that was definitely part of the, the, the motivation for me too. It gives you a lot of financial freedom to, mm -hmm. to, to set your own rates and to, to work when you want, how you want. Um, if you want to work four days a week, you can, if you want to work seven, you can. <laughs> yeah. Well, me too. Like with just the, this crazy release of Revit 22, I went, you know, at the mm -hmm. work basically <laughs> all day long, but then yeah, yeah. next week yeah. my, my I plan that too. is to kind yeah. of chill a little bit. And yeah, sometimes you know, I just have like a YouTube day where I just smash uh, out videos for a day and, and I don't work. I don't, I don't technically make any money for the day, but then like, you know, I work the next day and you make like three times what you used to in a normal wage on a day. So it's like, well, I just yeah. gave myself an extra day and used one up. So perfect. <laughs> so it's a, yeah. it's a, it's a great way, but it does also, it's challenging because you're not necessarily looking at a salary week to week. So that's also the mm -hmm. challenge is sort of everything comes in packets of packets of income. So it's an interesting way to sort yeah, of. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I, I know that uh, my, my first couple of nights after officially leaving my job, I was laying in bed. Oh my God, did I write to the, the, yeah, it's the weird, right isn't thing? it? Suddenly it the number's be... not going up anymore. It's, yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> yeah, but I mean, you know, like financially the, the rivet pure the website and all my other side mm. gigs were doing well so it was not really yeah. rational to be scared about it but it's still part of you you know that yeah uh, and, and passive income is good like that too yeah, i mean exactly. my online store sales sales are mm -hmm. great i have a notification pinger that just tells me every time a yeah, sale yeah. comes on the store mm -hmm. and sometimes it's sort of just like like six in a row or something like wow <laughs> so it's good to have passive avenues as well so um but yeah congratulations on on that decision that's a really big one so yeah um, and i have just i think you'll do uh, really well it's funny. I've just hired somebody part time to help me uh, with uh, the the website, and she's yeah, she's yeah, originally yeah. from Quebec, but she now lives in uh, Melbourne, uh, Australia. Oh, cool. So I have to, oh, small uh, world. <laughs> to yeah, to, like we organize chat. Like it's morning for her, when it's evening for me. So I have meetings uh, later on in the night. So anyway, uh, we're eventually going to get to <laughs> yeah, uh, to, the, to the demos. Yeah, uh, a Rhino, <laughs> but it's interesting to to chat about. No, well, I guess this is like one of the first times we've spoken in person, yeah, yeah. so I guess we've yeah. just got so much to talk about, don't we? Yeah, <laughs> yeah we'll have to but, do another chat. But anyway, time. to conclude that, if you uh, some people interested in becoming a consultant and doing this kind of work full time, my advice would be start before leaving your job. You know, you don't have the thing about yep. quitting your job and starting your business. It's like, well, no, you can start before quitting your job. It's much better this way, you know, and you can try to see if you like it. 
So that, that only works advice. on the movies. <laughs> and when advice you... number two is if you're working on something, uh, create Revit or whatever BIM related idea you want to show, create a YouTube channel and just show it to the public, show it to the world. And it's a great way to, yeah, to get some attention, but to um, gain skills uh, for public communication. And so, yeah, that would be my uh, recommendation. Mm, great advice. I mean, it builds authenticity as well. That's one mm -hmm. thing that I find a lot of consultants struggle to to build. They don't necessarily look very authentic from the outside. It's like, you know, pay us first and then we'll talk to you. So it's good to have that public persona as well. Mm. Yeah. So having a look at the uh, the, the chat, Somebody says, uh, I heard Revit 2022 have PDF problem issue where fonts aren't printed properly. Uh, Jacob Small says, all printing in Revit was recently broken by a Windows update. Yeah, I I've heard Die Roots uh, say that their plugin already fixed that issue. So mm -hmm. if you have that issue, try the Die Roots uh, Pro Sheets plugin, which uh, should help you. From what I understood, that was PDF 24 actually clashing with a Windows really? update. Okay. Um, I think that was what that cause was. The, the, the print driver they used had a um, incompatibility um, with, with the Windows update, uh, okay. you know, which, which they, they tend to cause all sorts of trouble, don't they? <laughs> all right. So we'll, uh, do I went to my list of one to chat about? Yeah, sure. So we're going to jump. Okay. So now I, we can see your screen. And oh, yeah, cool. before, yeah, just a last thing. I got my beer here. So cheers and uh, thanks for being uh, here, Gavin. Nice to finally oh, you're meet welcome. you. You're welcome. Yeah, I should have brought a beer from the fridge <laughs> as well. I've got a couple there. <laughs> so yeah, yeah no you can drink your coffee and- uh, uh, Imaginary, beer. imaginary coffee. I've already yeah. had one. I don't want to see colors. So <laughs> All right, <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, but um, I guess we'll get started. So um, yep. I, um, do you want me to just introduce the subject matter and we'll go from there? Or is that probably the easiest way to go? Yeah, well, I guess we, we, we can uh, talk a little uh, about Rhino first. The last time I used yeah, Rhino, sure. I was in, in college and I've built some sort of, for a class, some sort of script with a VBNet programming language that was a, a packing script, which was kind of making uh, circles in a certain limits, packing as many circles as possible. So that's the last time I've used Rhino. I haven't used it in, in uh, 10 years now. Mm, so I guess, um, I mean, I'll, I'll just start by showing Rhino, I guess, because a lot yeah, of people probably ahead. haven't used it. Um, so in this case, I'm in Rhino here. So it's, it's, it's a little bit different to Revit in that it's not really a BIM environment. It can be turned into a BIM environment with metadata inside objects. Um, but really, uh, most people use it as a really good solid modeling environment. Um, it can handle a lot of geometry classes that Revit might struggle with. So for a lot of things, um, you might actually, you know, find it a lot easier to use Rhino. I mean, even if I take something as simple as a, uh, I might just do a, a wacky shape and just copy this. And I'm, I'm not necessarily going to do too much freeform modeling. So I know the focus here is Rhino inside as well. Um, but if I take this and I rotate it, and I'm, I'm probably, hopefully this is going to work. I'm probably, you know, I'm probably going to do the SketchUp thing where I'm drawing into Oblivion, but. <laughs> Uh, but you can do things like lofts that might be quite complex in a in a 3D modeling environment. Now at the moment I'm not using Grasshopper, I'm just using Rhino, um, so it's a little bit different. But it's obviously like you know these sort of shapes can be quite can be quite difficult. I think I can rebuild this into you know more complex typologies as well. So it's it's a very quick program to put together quite complex forms. Um, but as you know, this can also be done using programs like Grasshopper. Mm -hmm. um, so I've got a few videos on Grasshopper and Rhino um, on my channel, but I probably won't. Uh, I'll probably have to remake them because they're probably a little bit out of date. I'm using Rhino 7 here, which is the latest build. Um, the user interface is quite similar, um, but now I'm in Grasshopper. So this is essentially like running Dynamo in Revit. Uh, likewise, you can run Grasshopper Yeah, can in you Rhino. quickly introduce what Grasshopper is? Uh, I've heard about it. I haven't used it in, mm. in, a, in a really long time, but it's basically it's Dynamo, but for Rhino. What yeah, I mean, one could argue that Dynamo it. took a heavy inspiration from Grasshopper, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, Grasshopper's been around for, I think, at least 10 years now. Um, so I think that, like, most of what we see in Dynamo, probably, that, that the e EMQ uh, originally built um, for, for his vision and then, you know, packaged with Autodesk, um, I guess is seen also there as well. So we have the same logic as nodes, so I can create, like, a curve. Um, I'll just delete this surface and we can instead take these curves. And then if I want to loft them, I can search for a function and sure enough, I have a loft. I can search for it in various tabs. This is a really cool feature. 
um, where you can just highlight things and it points to them and tells you where they are. <laughs> so there's a like one thing that I love about Grasshopper that I'm going to accentuate throughout uh, this this talk is just that like Grasshopper to me is a triumph in visual experience design. It's um it's very fluid and very fun to use. Um, you can go very deep. You can do a lot of crazy things in it, even silly things like this is a package called Moonlight. Um, which lets you basically just instantly put yourself in in night mode. <laughs> so like it, there's just fun little things like that that people build for it that you couldn't necessarily do in a program like Dynamo. Um, it's probably possible in Dynamo, but I've just found because it's been around a bit longer, people have pushed it a little bit harder and, and it sort of is a lot more flexible in that data is always flowing and it can flow in all sorts of directions. Um, but I don't want to talk too deeply about that because I'll probably confuse people too fast. So anyway, I can create a loft and we can see now we have like a preview. And obviously if I move things around, you can see the shape, you know, pretty much knows what to do. So it's pretty, pretty fun. And, you know, I can really quickly do some things that would actually be quite difficult in like a planar based environment like Revit. Um, most people know that at some point I would just break Revit by doing this. It would just go, no, I'm going to destroy this form because it's turning in on itself. And now we can see that, this form's still pretty much maintaining itself, um, despite the fact it's quite, you know, non-planar. Whereas in a conceptual modeling environment, you'd probably need to host this element as an adaptive profile and rotate it around that point, which is obviously much harder. Um, but as well as this, there's other things that you can do from here. So I can do something like cap the ends of this, this shape. And now I have a, I should have a solid, you know, closed BREP. And, and eventually I can also bake these things back into Rhino as forms. So now this is actually inside my model. And I'm welcome to go and manipulate it and do whatever I want to it in the Rhino environment. Um, now, this is just a very basic example of how Grasshopper works. It can actually do really complicated things. So before I jump into Rhino inside, I might show you some of the more fun little scripts I've built that really just were me pushing Grasshopper to its limits, I guess, that I could find. Um, having said that, I've definitely not pushed Grasshopper to its limits. I'm, I'm, I wouldn't necessarily say I'm an expert in Grasshopper. I'd say I'm just a... A user that likes to have a lot of fun and experiment. So I have a, a quick um, question for, for you. Do, do you think uh, yeah, people sure. should uh, learn Grasshopper first or they sh should they learn it at the same time they're learning yeah. Rhino? Yeah, great question. Um, I think it depends on their background. I find if you're a designer or if you work with forms, feasibility studies, uh, massing, I think Rhino and Grasshopper is definitely a better place to begin. You'll be far less frustrated by the work plane based environment that Revit offers, um, which to be honest is actually good in some cases when you're working with BIM, work planes are good. They let you host a lot of things to something that you can move around. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying that Revit's all bad. It's actually a good system when you use it right. Um, but I think that you'll find the fluidity of the Rhino modeling platform combined with the um, the design language that Grasshopper really speaks um, will, will really quickly give you a good dive into visual programming. Um, whereas Dynamo is probably better for people that work with, say, documentation, project setup, model management. Yeah, it's team. more data management. Uh, like there's that, that's really where I use it for tools, mostly. So. If I do mm -hmm. heavy geometry exercises now, I tend to use Rhino inside mm -hmm. just because the geometric processing speed of Rhino is very fast as well. Um, so something that might crash Dynamo potentially um, will not usually crash Grasshopper. Um, for example, reading a, a, a 5,000 poly city model with 5,000 faces on it, mm -hmm. Dynamo would probably just go huh, and crash. Um, whereas Grasshopper okay. would say, no, no problems, I've got this. Yeah, yeah. And, and you could keep using it from there. So which we need sometimes. Sometimes we do city models and we need mm -hmm. like a complex model um, where Rhino just can't do it. Like, you know, you've got like Dynamaps, for example, but the buildings are all blocks and they're not accurate. So, um, and I'm not saying that's Dynamaps fault. That's just the data source that they draw from isn't isn't fully accurate. It's uh, I think OpenStreetMap. So would you um, say so it's uh, uh, these tools are mostly for designers? Yeah, I think Grasshopper is definitely built for designers. Um, you can do a lot of things with it that probably go outside the realm of design. Um, you can do a lot of data processing in here. So if you want to process Excel files, CSV files, you probably could do that in here as well. Um, there's all there's other things in here too. Like there's a physics engine called Kangaroo. So this is a little script I built um, in Rhino running in real time that can just, you know, drop balls out of a <laughs> out of a box. I can make the box bigger. Um, I can, essentially I can drop it, I can pause it, I can explode it. So like, and this is just all running inside Grasshopper. So just like, this is a fun little demo I did and I can keep, keep blowing it up if I want to. So there's all sorts of little abstract things in here as well. And sometimes you sort of need to really think about ways they can be applied more rationally. There's things like mapping images to elements. So here, for example, um, just in a homage to John Pearson, I've put a doge onto uh, a facade. Okay. Um, and these are all actually just rotating panels based on the darkness of an image. So you can see I'm actually turning these little shutter panels. 
uh, based on how dark or light the pixel of an image is and creating one for it. So you can do a lot of things like transposing uh, images and, and maps onto facades and designs. That's actually quite a common application I've seen Grasshopper used for um, because a lot of the time that is the inspiration for an image. But you can also use it to store images uh, for facades as well. So you actually start constructing different types of data types to store elements in your project. Like you might run a generative algorithm that generates 5,000 facade options and you can store them just all as like a PNG file and then open them in a different program like Dynamo or Revit and you can read them um, in that way as well. So it's a good way to sort of teach people about uh, interoperability as well. Um, before Rhino Inside, we did already use Rhino quite a lot in Grasshopper, but we relied more on Excel files and mm -hmm. images and other types of files to sort of transport that data between those environments. Yeah, so I guess the, these are tools mostly used for w what you would call generative design or uh, parametric is one architecture. Aspect. It's, it's a yeah. very powerful generative engine compared mm -hmm. to the... Um, the Autodesk one, I would say, in terms of yeah, the speed yeah. that it works at, which is really necessary for generative design when you want to push it as hard as you can. Um, the generative design tool for Autodesk, it, it's good. Like it's not, it just doesn't work at a speed um, that we would need it to for, for the really intense studies that we run overnight sometimes in Grasshopper. Yeah, we I, might push something I, I like see them five more, hours generating a thousand options an hour. So I mm. see them more as a proof of concept for, for the moments like uh, here with you, you can do but it's more like okay that's kind of points where Autodesk might be heading next more than yeah, actually being might helpful be a, might, might be a tool for marketing too yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but, so I mean and there's things you can do here like gravitational forces so this is like a flocking algorithm I built that essentially just loops things around like actual gravitational fields and and, I, and this is all real time this is running a script like every millisecond it's updating the script so and I can do things like increase the speed so so you can get pretty wacky with um, Grasshopper, but like you can use this to find like emergent forms. So like not literally this script, but I know other scripts use similar techniques to find like stable states to generate like the optimal facade shape. So you can notice eventually, if I run this for long enough, it's actually going to find like a, you know, a holding pattern. So we use like a lot of these algorithms, what we call relaxation, um, to take something into like a, a rule set and try to get it to sit as calmly as possible. So we might be doing something like optimizing the size of facade panels. Um, this is using a looping algorithm that essentially just says keep going, keep going, keep going until it's happy. And then eventually you can tell it to stop. This is using a package called an enemy someone built. Um, and these are just all little fun things. So eventually I will get to run on side. <laughs> but I did want to share just the, the, the fun aspect of um, using Grasshopper as well. So are these I guess tools... I wasn't really a Grasshopper user until about maybe two years ago. So mm -hmm. if anyone feels like it's too hard for them to start, um, definitely not. Uh, I probably at first opened Rhino about, I think, two, two and a half years ago. So um, like you can do things like this. So you can, you know, tessellate things down and eventually, um, if I turn this on. So have you been using uh, a lot of these tools on uh, actual projects? Uh, yeah, so yeah. we use them quite a lot for environmental analysis. Um, and sometimes <clears throat> we'll take something like a facade that's quite irrational and we'll try to relax it into a a stable state. For example, this this is an algorithm, quite a famous one called Lloyd's algorithm, which uses Voronoi divisions to try to create equal cell sizes. Um, and it keeps resourcing each center of each cell to create a new iteration of like a looping script. So this is actually running like multiple times. You can start to see things are transforming and moving. Um, but we can apply this to, to curved surfaces as well. And we use this sometimes to try and optimize uh, facade panel types. Let's say the contractor only wants say five or six um, panel types on the job. Um, I can't show you the algorithms we use because they're quite IP sensitive and everything. I work with clients, but um, we essentially can relax the model into say, having maybe six or seven panel types across a really complex double curved or buckled facade. Um, so a lot of these concepts get transformed into something a lot more, a lot more rational. Um, the, the, the physics engine can do a lot of other pretty wacky things as well. So we have like a surface here, for example, and I can, I can basically just create a surface in Grasshopper that I can start playing with. And then I can start applying physics to it. So, so we can do things like tensile geometry as well. So I did actually have a client that wanted to do sail modeling. Um, and I showed them adaptive components as one option I showed them, but then I also showed them grasshopper and they actually went with grasshopper in the end. Um, and you can do things like I'll, I'll, I'll let go of maybe two of the corners. So now this is just floating in space, but then I might also add some wind. <laughs> and I think at some point you should be able to see it. There we go. And now we have a flag in the wind. So that there's some pretty complex things you can do in here that you, you just couldn't do in Dynamo. Um, you just couldn't do it in Revit. Um, it, it's a very different engine. Um, but yeah, you, you can just have a lot of fun. I think um, if 
probably the last thing I'll show you. Uh, I mean, I've got a little puzzle maker there. That was a fun little task I did, but this is probably like to show you how abstract you can get. Um, I built a video game <laughs> in Grasshopper okay. just to test my looping capabilities. So in this case, I'm using like a, a different type of input. So like I said, Grasshopper is like a visual experience design um, dream. In the, I have a little slider here, and this is actually like a two-dimensional slider. So whilst mm -hmm. in Dynamo, you have like a one-directional slider. Here we have like a, you can move up and you can move across. So it's like two dimensions. It's essentially a UV slider. Um, so if I reset this game, I'm essentially just protecting the middle, <laughs> the middle of the circle from all these little little enemy spheres and, and eventually it gets to the end and you know I find out how bad I did. Um, so you can do some pretty pretty crazy things in it. Um, this is using looping again, but this was just me teaching myself about looping because behind the scenes I'm actually going and passing a lot of data yeah. around. So it does get pretty complex pretty fast. I'm going to go probably back a step with Rhino inside and we're just going to start with the absolute basics, like how you can just get an element into Rhino, look yeah. at its parameters, and then I'll show you some workflows that I've built on the back of those principles. Sure. Before um, we get yeah, going, so uh, ju just having a quick glance at the chat, uh, Tesla says, awesome presentation. Thanks. Scour DX if, says, if, oh, Autodesk Scour about, I'm cool. <laughs> if Autodesk about Rhino, that would be hell on earth. Yeah. Oh, yeah, no, I, I don't want Autodesk to buy Rhino. <laughs> McNeil has a great team. Um, so I think yeah, that yeah. they should definitely keep doing what they're doing and, you know, stay true to themselves. I think, that, I think it's good to have. Any website where we can find free packages? Yeah, uh, Food for Rhino food um, for would Rhino. be the place to go. So if you go to Food for Rhino, um, you essentially will find a whole bunch of packages that you can feed to Rhino. Um, so, for example, if you're looking for like an anemone, uh, I always spell it wrong. An anemone. There we go. I think it's an anemone. This is like the looping package I was using to do all that looping. And you, you can find all the versions. You can download the one that you want and you just click and drag them onto Rhino usually, or onto Grasshopper, sorry, and it'll just install itself for you. Um, so definitely check out Food for Rhino. Um, I think there's something like 450 packages or packages on there and most of them are fairly good as well. It's not like um, in the Dynamo package manager where the, the third package is called Colin McCrone, I think. Um, I've, I've seen that, that bugger's name for, for the last few years every time I look for packages because he named one after himself and just left it there. Okay. <laughs> and he put an at symbol in front of it. So it's like, it has to be the first thing you see. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Buddy Colin McCrone. Um, anyway, and I don't seem to clean him off for some reason. Um, but I guess um, before I jump into this is an example of how we might use Rhino with a bit more project context. So um, I have like a city model here. So this is already something that, you know, Revit might struggle to get in a workable format. Um, I just got this directly off a website called CadMapper, just downloaded it natively um, last night and just imported it directly. And this is what I get. So I get all the building shapes as closed solids in this case. I think they should be um, closed boundary representations or closed extrusions, yep. Um, I've just drawn some lines and these are gonna be like my site boundaries. So I actually went and demolished a few buildings from the site. So I, as you can see, Rhino uses layers as well, which is something that sometimes you don't use in Revit because we have the category control. Mm -hmm. uh, but sometimes layers do give us more flexibility of how we can organize our model, um, which sometimes is, is much more helpful when you're doing feasibility and options. Sometimes design options are a little bit too clunky and slow. I find to work between, whereas having the ability to really quickly flick things on and off is quite nice. Um, and I guess um, throughout, I'll just reinforce, like I use Revit too, so this definitely isn't a Revit bash. Um, so it's more just um, a different way of working that might suit people more, um, depending what they're doing. So I have a I have a solar plane, I just modeled a mock-up of just, let's, let's, let's say there's a park over here that we're trying to prevent sun from being blocked from, so we have to reverse engineer a plane back to it. This is a very common thing we do in Sydney um, and a lot of other cities have the same principle. Like I think Toronto has pretty much the same principle. Um, I did one project there um, recently um, with, a, with a client. Um, so in this case, I've drawn a site boundary and a couple of like, tower outlines. And I'm gonna use this just to generate an entire, a time, ent entire building with areas um, just from those three elements. So I have a script I've built. And again, it's, it's a heavy script. So, so I'm not saying it's easy just to set it up straight away. Uh, but I built this last night just to give you an idea of how long this takes. I think I spent about an hour building this. Um, so this is probably closer to what I'd call a, a developed script. So it's got a lot of areas that do different things. But all the way back to the front, I've just put all the inputs at the front. So at the moment, I'm generating a tower over here for option two. And I've got all these principles I can use to change things, like maybe the street walls 30 meters. So I can change this and my form should, um, should update. Uh, no, I don't want to just cancel that. 
Um, so did, did you like, start from uh, an existing script or have you built that whole script I built yourself? this last night um, in about oh, maybe an hour and a half. Okay. So because um, Grasshopper is such a visually fluid environment, I find mm -hmm. eventually you can actually be quite fast in it as well. It's not mm -hmm. quite as slow to work in, I find. I'm, I'm a bit slow when I work in Dynamo. Um, but having said that, I do very different things in Dynamo as well. So I probably do a lot more testing in Dynamo because I'm modifying Revit models, which is a more high risk uh, environment, I guess. Um, so at the moment I can, I can do things like I can change the height of my intervention floor so I can change my program mix really quickly and easily. So you can see the flexibility is there. I can, I can shave off minimum floor areas. I can start culling floors if they're too, too small and eventually I can get under solar planes. Um, at the moment I haven't quite built it right because these can creep over the solar plane. So I didn't quite build it right. Um, but I'd have to just change the logic of that. Um, and eventually I can also just bake things in so I can take the podium and take commercial. I can take plant and I can take residential and I can actually bake these onto layers. Um, I'm using a package here called Elefront, which is like my favorite package. I'm going to be showing you how it works with Rhino inside as well, which allows you to essentially bake objects in with attributes. Um, so this is sort of like BIM in Rhino. Um, and I am going to make all these scripts available, by the way. So if anyone's saying, oh, I don't understand what I'm looking at, don't worry, you'll be able to see it in detail um, on my GitHub as well. So if you want to download them and play with them, um, this will all be available. Um, but in this case, you can see, uh, first of all, I've given it a name, residential. So this shape has data. Um, it also knows that it's on a layer belonging to option two residential. And this has all been directed by Grasshopper. So I haven't had to tell it where to go uh, manually. And I've also given it some things too, like which option did it come from? I've also used a feature called bake name as well. So if I go and ruin my design by moving things around or deleting things, obviously that would be a, a problem usually. Um, if I rerun the same thing again, it just goes and finds all those elements and refreshes that bake essentially. So we use a lot of these tricks to to maintain options um, concurrently between between projects. Um, I can also do things like just take a whole different site and just based on the naming of um, these layers, I can just go and draw from different options. So I have like a lot one building lines one, lot two building lines two, and these essentially are just the layers these lines are sitting on. So if I switch over to option one. I can just generate the same study, but on a different site. So if I have an algorithm that's really easily applied to different sites, um, you can see it's, it's just super quick to rapidly prototype a concept. Um, often we get asked by clients in cities, they might have three or four sites that they want to compare. They might be comparing the metrics of them as well. Um, so th this can be a really handy tool. And if you just want to modify little parameters, like what happens if I should make my lob lobby say double height, um, you can start looking at the impact that has on areas without going into Excel and building silly formulas to represent a, a building that, you know, would just much be better represented in 3D. Um, and then of course I can just go and bake in these things as well. And, and I, could, I could make the script way more uh, intelligent, easy to use. Um, I've just built it to suit my needs, but um, I guess, can, like, again, I built it in like an hour. Can you so remind you can me of what, uh, sorry, what the bake, uh, baking, uh, what, what that means? Yep. Yeah, so baking is um, sort of like taking the preview that Grasshopper gives you and committing it to actual elements in Rhino. So at the moment, if I have this, this element here, this is actually a poly surface inside Rhino. Um, so this doesn't belong to Grasshopper anymore. It's sort of like if you use Dynamo to create a wall, um, before you go and generate that wall, you're probably using something like a location line to dictate where that wall is going to go. Um, but until you run that script and generate the wall, it, it doesn't exist in Revit technically. It just exists in the Dynamo engine and Grasshopper is no different. Um, we, we really just manipulate shapes in various stages until we reach the end where we actually go and bake in the particular form that we're dealing with. Um, sometimes we don't even bake things in, we're just analyzing. So we might just be looking at preview geometry. So if I take all these, say these elements here, and I just, um, oh, actually I'll, I'll get rid of, I'll get rid of all of them. So at the moment I have like these two, two sets of baked elements. If I delete them, note that now I don't see option one and that's because I was only previewing it before. Then I baked it and then I switched over to another site. So, so I've pretty much got like the actual geometry on top of preview. So at the moment there's actually nothing, nothing here. Like it's just a preview that Grasshopper is generating for me. Whoops, I moved my solar plane. Um, so if I go like forward in the script to say maybe the point where I deal with my solar plane, um, I think that might be, no, that's where I'm segmenting my floors. Um, but we, we essentially take it through a whole bunch of transformations. Uh, where do I split my geometry? It's a problem with building something in, in one night, you sort of forget where you put everything. Uh, divide building at height, here we go. 
I know I take I take a point where I, I turn this thing into like a big intersector. And, um, and so uh, like for a script like this, is this something that you can uh, give to your client, for example, or is it something that requires um, you know, your, it your attention? It depends on how comfortable the client is in using these types mm -hmm. of programs, I guess. Usually we more likely would potentially pilot the script whilst they're in a meeting with us. Mm -hmm. So it might become a design discussion tool. Like they might go, oh, why don't we go over to this site and test something out? And assuming you've built the script to be flexible enough, you can essentially use it as an aid. Um, we actually tend to build scripts to be very flexible so that you can just use a script on a project without mm -hmm. knowing too many things about it. Um, so as long as you have basic inputs like these curves, you can really work with these to generate quite meaningful studies quite quickly. Um, for example, this, um, this solar plane, uh, at one point I just go and push this thing down into the ground and that's just so I can intersect it with with this, just an overextended tower to get the, I guess, the maximum possible height of each of these by intersecting those two elements. So we do a lot of geometric sort of rule-based uh, aspects of each script, and these can be repackaged into other other logical workflows, I guess, on there as well. I can also just, you know, take out a tower by just deleting deleting one of the towers and recomputing my script, and it will just, you know, take it out of the equation. So it's very quick to, to interact between these two environments once you know them a little bit better. Um, uh, but I guess at the moment, one challenge that a lot of companies face is that, that, that their teams document in Revit, but they uh, they maybe analyze and compute a lot of stuff in Rhino, and there's definitely like a, a disconnection between those two environments, and that's sort of where Rhino Inside comes in. Um, another thing we use it for a lot is just analysis as well. So we use the Ladybug package to run things like solar studies. Um, if anyone's had to do like a sun hour study before, so how much sun does a room actually receive? Um, there's not really that many tools that Autodesk offers that can do this. They do have um, Insight and Illuminance rendering, uh, but I guess Cloud Credits, there's a, there's a lot of reasons why you might not want to. Uh, I think I've done them. that with uh, 3DS. I think they have some. Yeah, so uh, 3DS has, um, they have sun or light rendering, I think they can do as well, where they do passes with um, mm -hmm. Illuminance. But this is if you actually want to measure like precisely how much sun the room receives. Um, so if we have certain requirements to meet, we, we use this to actually prove these like numerically. Um, so one of the Rhino Inside studies I'll show you will actually go and go and do that. Um, we'll go and run a, a sun study across a model. So I think I've probably been in Rhino and Grasshopper a little bit too long, so I might just jump straight into Revit. Yeah, and sure. we'll start looking at Rhino Inside, I think. Um, but what I might do first is I'll just make sure I've got a file that's ready because I'm going to take these, these buildings um, and I'm going to just work forward with them. So these are just two that I generated earlier. Um, so I think everything's still on in the background. Yep. So I'm going to actually turn these into Revit families using Rhino Inside as well. Um, I might do that last, so we might revisit this element. Um, I'm just going to show you some of the fundamentals in Rhino Inside first, just to show you how it works. Um, just to give people a starting point, because I know I haven't really given a starting point yet. So <laughs> I've given like a, a destination, I guess. So in this case, um, I might just work with a sample project um, that I've built. So, so I, I guess uh, my first question would be, is Rhino Inside, is it a plugin? Yes. So it in this case, we can um, download and install it. So if we go to Rhino Inside, I think they still class it as a beta um, in terms of how they how they name it. Um, but if you go to Rhino Inside Revit at rhino3d.com inside Revit, uh, there'll be an installer. And I believe that it works all the way back to version maybe 2018, 2017. Um, but I typically use it in 2020 and beyond. Um, so um, you can just download it from here. It's going to ask you for an email. And from there, you can just uh, download an EXE that will install itself into Revit. Um, and you will need a valid license for Rhino. That is one thing Rhino Inside does require. Is so Rhino... There was a, a, a work in progress Rhino for a while. Is um, Rhino expensive? And, uh, it's not too bad, actually. Okay. It's about... I think it's a thousand US dollars for a perpetual license. So perpetual license. Oh, the old system. Yeah, just for the full license, and that includes Grasshopper as well. Um, oh, okay. It is one of those programs that you probably do want to test before you do. Um, so whilst most companies offer like a month trial, um, Rhino offers ninety days, which is pretty crazy as well. Mm -hmm. And that's just the full program, no no locks on it or anything. It does, as far as I know, everything works the same. Mm -hmm. So um, I mean, McNeil and Associates is definitely one of my favorite software developers in terms of how they they operate. Um, I think that they're, they're very community driven. They're, 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 they're great if you ever reach out to them as well. They actually have um, Asan um, from Pi Revit is working with them on Rhino Inside. A lot of people probably know know him. Um, so he's, yeah, he's yeah. been a driving force behind this as well. Yeah, really. um, but they've actually reached out to me a lot as well and just said, hey, do you need like any any help? Um, they saw I was producing some videos and they had some corrections and said, oh, there's a better way to do it like this if that helps. And they're, they're very engaging. So 
um, yeah, I think it's a great community to become a part of. Um, so once you install it, um, noting that I'm using the latest version, they've changed it a little bit in the latest version, how you, how you access it in Revit. But I'm just in Revit at the moment, just in a sample project that you can find for free on my website. Um, so this is this is all free. This is built to my standards. So if anyone's looking for a Revit model to play around with, um, this one might might do. It looks like the basic sample project, but it's not. It's um, yeah, it's, it's similar, but it's so uh, it's it's, it's the it's, modified it's, house. It's the basic or? sample project on steroids. Okay. So um, <laughs> it's essentially properly done. So there's structure in it. There's proper families. Okay. Uh, you know, proper documentation that looks like documentation. So you know, real floor plans. At the moment, I've actually put a color scheme on the views. This actually uh -huh. shows how much sun each view is receiving. So eventually we're going to light these rooms up using Rhino inside to show how many sun hours they receive. Oh, cool. Um, but it has things like RCPs and elevations, wet areas. So if you're looking just for a good reference for, you know, just how I do things in Revit, this might might be of interest to you, but it's all free. So um, just because I, cool. I, thought, I thought I should at least give one thing for free on my website. Yeah, yeah. Um, so but I'm going to use this model just because it's clean, it's well set up. So it's it's good. It's got a lot of clean data in it as well, which is great to have when you're working with something like Rhino inside because we're going to be relying on data a lot in Rhino to identify what elements are back in Revit as well. Um, but in this case, uh, where was I? I was in my project. I was showing you where Rhino inside was. So if I go to uh, rhino.inside as a tab, it used to be under add-ins before the latest update, I noticed. Um, but now we can just click on start. And this is going to open Rhino inside Revit. So it's behaving like an add-in, but essentially what the Rhino team did is they, they reworked Rhino to be what's called headless. So it can run inside other programs without showing you itself essentially until you want to. So it really does behave like an add-in. Um, it's essentially hooking into the, the libraries of commands that Revit uses as well. So we have direct access to the Revit API inside Rhino as well, which is pretty powerful for anyone that knows how to write in API, so in the, in the um, Grasshopper Python components in Grasshopper, you can actually talk to Revit using all the commands. So you could do anything technically you can do in Dynamo um, inside Rhino now as well, if you really want to put all the time and effort in. Having said that, I do get asked by a lot of people, should I just build all my Dynamo scripts in Grasshopper? And I say no, because you've got to go and open Rhino, you've got to open Grasshopper, you've got to have users that are comfortable using it. You, you lose access to Dynamo Player, Data Shapes, there's all sorts of reasons why you wouldn't just want to put everything in Rhino. Um, I think it's just using the best tools for the best parts of the job that they suit. Um, so in this case, you know, I use it for geometric analysis, environmental analysis, things that uh, Revit has weak points in that I can really fix using Rhino inside. Um, but anyway, we've got Rhino inside available now just on this, this tab. Um, in this case, I think it's under add-ins, uh, Rhino inside. Yep. So now I'm just going to open Rhino in Revit. So this it looks the same as Rhino, but now it's actually inside Revit as well. Um, I'm just going to have to make sure I've got my windows laid out. It can be a little bit hard if you if you do something like Rhino over Revit because every time you go back to Revit, it's going to sort of try to hide hide Rhino. So I am just going to go and sort of give them about half of half of my screen each. Usually I work on two or three screens just when I'm doing this because yeah, it's yeah, a lot sure. easier to to work between everything. Um, um, but I'm just going to maximize my 3D viewport. And let's just start with something basic. So I'm going to open Grasshopper, inside Rhino, inside Revit, um, Inception. <laughs> um, so in this case, I'm just going to go probably to begin with, I'm just going to work with this little tab that's now been added to Grasshopper, which is called Revit Primitives. Um, this just has a few sort of fundamental things, but you can already start to see things that Revit, you, you understand, like say things like floors, hosts, ceilings, faces. There's a lot of inputs that we already recognize that are more in the, the language of Revit, less in the language of, of, of Rhino, I guess. Um, but let's just go and get what we call a graphical element, which is essentially just a model element. So I'm going to select one element from the model. Uh, let's take my roof. And already we have like a preview for my roof in Rhino, um, running and talking directly to Revit. Um, it, I think it's running in real time as well. So I believe if anything happens to the roof, I believe Rhino should potentially pick up that change straight away. If not, I might have to recompute. There we go. Now it's picked it up. Obviously, I've just ruined my Revit model by doing that. <laughs> but um, let's not do that. But once I've got these elements, I can go and interrogate a lot of data out of them as well. So if I go to a lot of people, when they get Rhino inside, they go, oh, that's it. That, that's nothing. Like, I can't do anything with this. And then you go, oh, wait a second. I've got a new tab. And you're like, whoa, <laughs> this is all Rhino inside, this whole tab. So all these tools are Rhino inside. So it's a, it's a huge add-in. Um, it has a wow. lot of things, but it's all broken down by tab. So 
Yeah, there's a lot of things. There's a uh, lot of documents, families, filters, all sorts of things. Uh, Gavin quickly, uh, Enzo Cardinal asks, uh, Gavin, your sample project requires a promo code. Yes, um, it, it's um, it's on the, the description of the object on my website. Um, it should be, I want to be a, a guru, exclamation mark, I think. Um, but if you just copy that without the apostrophes from the description of the object on my website, you'll get it for free. Yeah, so so there's no, no tricks there, don't worry. <laughs> A lot of people um, miss that one, yeah. Eventually, I'll be moving it to a course platform where it's going to be much easier to access for free, but um, but that should give you a 100% I want to discount. be a guru. <laughs> <laughs> too many gurus, not enough uh, disciples. Yeah, too, too many fake gurus out there. I like to think I'm a real one. <laughs> You're definitely one as well. I'll, I'll give you the certified guru stamp. <laughs> um, so at this point, we have an element in, in Rhino. Um, so what we can do with it is, let's say, maybe take something about the element. Let's just get maybe category so this is something that we understand in Revit and now we can see its category is roof so we're starting to get information from the element inside Rhino um, we can do things like um, I think there's an inspect element or preview element I might just do an element preview we can even get things like LOD controls so you know what level of detail are we looking at fine medium coarse so we can get different representations of the element um, I think in this case we can just say how good of a quality is the output of the geometry in Rhino so maybe I'll Maybe I'll show the Rhino tab as well. So now we're seeing a direct preview of the element, which is a little bit different. But from here, we have a mesh. And we could actually just bake this in to Rhino. So now I have this as native geometry inside Rhino that I can play around with and do things to. So already, it's um, it's 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 pretty strong. as just a, a connection between them that's very easy to use. Um, but I can do things like draw parameter values out of it. So if I go to the element's parameters, um, and I just get a, I think it's called a filter mask. I believe um, it's under parameters tab. Uh, might just get a, I'll get a panel, just to view all this stuff. So we can see all this information about the element that we can access. And these are all just Revit parameters. So we can see all the information is pretty much available. We can see we have an ID parameter, so let's get that. So what we can do now is go back to our Revit tab and we'll just get an element parameter. And I have a lot of tutorials on my channel that do this, so I'm not going to try to go too deep on this. So in this case, I believe uh, I'm, I'm getting the parameter. I need to get the element. And now we can see that I can interrogate specific properties about elements, and there we go. Um, obviously, I can go even further and just you know select multiple elements with my script still set up this way. And I can just go and have a look at you know uh, 287 elements, and you saw how quick that was. Um, now, using Dynamo is actually quite quick as well to do things like this when you're just interacting with elements because you're essentially just talking to a database. Um, it's when you start dealing with things like geometry when it gets a little bit more complex. So what I've already done there is I have geometry for all those elements I selected. So that's something that Dynamo wouldn't have comfortably done. It would have probably spun around for maybe about you know, 10, 10 to 15 seconds. And if you're on like a 20-story tower project, um, obviously that's a lot bigger than this project as well. And that's where that geometric limitation will really start to, you know, limit what you can do with Dynamo if you want to deal with geometry natively. Um, obviously from there, I can also just bake in. So the way you, uh, you would use uh, Rhino inside, is it mostly to interact with existing Revit geometry? Or you um, could typically, bring yes. in uh, Rhino in, inside Revit, like bringing Yeah, it Rhino. depends on the project okay. phase and what we're using it for. So often in a feasibility project, we might use it to drive element creation back in Revit. So we might generate levels from Rhino uh, based on just the, the heights that we're testing in a feasibility option. Once we're happy with one of the options and we want to proceed to document it, uh, we, we'd go and generate that level table out of Rhino and then push them into levels. So there is like an option to create a, a level in this case, I believe it's, um, I haven't actually done levels for a little while. So you have to forgive me here. I know it's in one of these tabs. I'll just try finding it here. Level, add level. There we go, it's under model. So you can see you can add grids, you can add levels, um, you can add uh, beams, columns, floors, adaptive components. So there's a lot of things that um, you can push back into Revit as well. I'll show you maybe a couple of examples I've put together that show how that works. Um, but you can do things like create families as well from Rhino Geometry. And, and all these tools are specifically for uh, the, the Revit, the Rhino Inside plugin. So these are uh, relating to, to Revit. They're, they're not native. In this Rhino case, tools. yes. Okay. Um, but it, you can also run Rhino Inside Unity, um, I think in AutoCAD as well. Uh, there's a few programs they've built integrations for. 
Um, so I guess I think in those cases they rely on the developers to do more work. Revit's the one that they've really focused on on developing from what I've seen, but um, there's definitely the potential for it to run in a lot of different programs just because it's been built to be headless and run like an application inside an application, essentially. They, they essentially talk in the same, uh, what we call memory space of the computer. So they essentially occupy, it, it's like putting two people in the same room. Um, they can talk to each other whilst they're in the room together. So it's the same sort of thing or it's or rev it's the room and Rhino is inside the room and it's talking to the room, <laughs> I guess is a more confusing metaphor. Um, to look at, so so that's sort of how we can we can work with that. Um, but I guess I probably might just show you some examples. Uh, but before I do this, I guess what I've done here is I've done a very uncontrolled selection from my model. I've just went and picked elements randomly. Um, a really super useful system we use in Rhino Inside is element filtering, which is something that's quite unique to to Rhino Inside, but also it's unique to the Revit API in that we essentially build these arguments to find a set of elements based on whether they meet that criteria. So it's a little bit like view filters in Revit, where you say um, has to meet these six criteria, and if it does, we're going to do something to them. We're essentially going to do the same thing to find elements, so I'm just going to get rid of all this, all this rubbish. And in this case, I'm actually going to go and I'll build a category filter. And in this case, I'm just going to look for a model category picker, which will just give me access to all the all the categories in the model. Now this can be a little bit hard. So what I sometimes prefer to do is just get a category, a query category node and just type in the name myself, or I think you might be able to put in a value list if you want to have multiple options. So this is a special tool inside um, Grasshopper. In this case, I'm just going to say generic models, floors, ceilings, walls. And what I'll have now is a drop down where I can just pick between those, those options. So that's a a value list if anyone's looking for it themselves. But what I'm going to do is now just going to say that I've got a filter for category, so I don't currently have any elements. But what I'm going to do now is I'm going to run this through a function that we call element query or query elements. And this expects filters or a filter. You can combine filters together using and or or conditions. Um, but then I'm just going to feed this in. And at that point, what we should have done it just went and found all the generic models in the Revit model. So in this case, you can see I've got a, all my down pipes, which are generic models. Um, in this case, you can do other things, like you can filter by whether it's visible in a view, whether it intersects with something, um, whether it has a specific type. Um, so there's lots of ways you can interact with these things. Um, you can also isolate elements by type quite easily as well. So there's a thing called an element type picker. This is a very interesting input in that it sort of waits for another input to give it more information, which is something Dynamo doesn't really do. So in this case, if I take maybe walls, uh, maybe that's a bad example. I'm able to convert. Ah, I've, I've got a value list, of course. I need to actually send the category in. There we go. So I'll just get rid of that. So if I go to say walls, I think I've triggered a little bit of an error there, but it's working anyway. You can see now I have all the types available to pick from as well. So there's a lot of stages of like picking and selection and filtering that we can use in order to break things down. I'm not quite sure why I've you know, triggered an error there. That's a bit of a funny one. Anyway. In this case, I've got a category. Hmm. Seems to work. Usually, I, usually I, I feed this into a model category picker, so that might be. I think I've, I've given a, an error to the model. I'll just make a new one. As most people most people know, with um, visual coding, you, you can get into errors quite quickly if you do things wrong. Yeah, I think I've triggered an error. That's all right. I'll just ignore it for now. <laughs> we'll keep working on. So in this case, I'm just going to take off this little limit because you can just say, give me the first 100 elements that I find because obviously in a big project, you might not want to get everything because you might kill your session if you get, say, like five, five million pieces of model text or something like that. Uh, but I'm just going to live dangerously and take away that filter. And at this point, we should have all the, the walls in the project, all 185 walls. And I've done this without having to select anything manually in the model. I'm just building a, a statement. And from here, I can do something like an element preview. And we have all the walls from Revit. And I can switch over to, say, all the floors, all the ceilings. So it's really quick to build up little like toolboxes that allow you to really quickly take elements out of Revit in a particular way. Uh, one really useful one that I use quite often is rooms. Um, we often will be testing things like solar studies on, a, on rooms. So that can be really useful. So if I take rooms. We now have all the room geometry from Revit, which we can use to intersect the base surface of the room and use that to test like the sun on, for example. So one of the, the examples I show you will sort of highlight that workflow and I'll, I'll run you through step by step how we do it. 
Um, but there's just there's so much here to explore, so I probably won't go too much further with the tabs themselves, but there's things like materials. You can build Revit materials from Rhino or vice versa. If you're trying to make your Rhino model look like your Revit model or vice versa, you can do that as well. Um, but I think I'll probably just go to some more detailed examples um, before I sort of dive too far into the specifics. Yeah, I, um, I guess my question would be, what is the, the most common task you would do using uh, the Revit geometry in, in Rhino? Yeah. So I'll, I'll show you that one as an example, I think. So the most common task we definitely use this for is for um, solar analysis. Um, so testing uh, the amount of sun that a building receives. I have a little YouTube series on this one, but I'll show you um, how, how I do this um, just step by step. Um, so I've built a set of five scripts that I run, but you could probably package this into one big toolbox. But essentially I have a, a model here and I've set in this case my, my project units, I think are in, in meters in this case, just because that's what um, that's what Ladybug prefers, and Ladybug is the environmental analysis toolbox for for Grasshopper that I'll be using. Um, yeah, so it's so, like a custom so package. Again, a Ladybug, it's a yep. plugin for Rhino. Yes, so this okay, is okay. Ladybug here. It's essentially a set of um, open source tools that are built to be used in various programs. So, for example, they're building an integration in Blender at the moment, uh, but in this case, they've got a very popular Grasshopper plugin set. Uh, that gives you access to solar analysis, daylight analysis, wind, few aspects, all sorts of um, sort of just environmental and quality of design uh, checkers that, that you can use. And, and they draw upon things like files that tell tell uh, Rhino about the weather. So they, they know which direction the sun's going to be facing for the next, you know, thousand years or so based on calculations that have been built into like a, an open source library. So it's um it's it's a really great way just to analyze your your design from a feasibility and an environmental impact perspective. Uh, so in this case, I'm actually going to test each room in my model and see how much sunlight it receives across a day. Um, I'm going to pick the worst day of the year as well. Um, I'm just going to close this Grasshopper script. And I'll just turn off my preview in Revit. Okay, so I'm going to open a few scripts in a few steps, and I'll just sort of explain what each, um, each step is doing as I go. Um, I think in this case, here we go. So the first thing we're going to be doing is actually putting... We're going to put all the geometry into Rhino, but we're not going to bake it across. I'm just going to export it to an FBX file from Revit, and I'm going to import it to meshes in Rhino. Um, this is actually something I've been experimenting with for a little while now, which a lot of people call the no-bake workflow, which is where you actually take the geometry in quite raw, and um, then you, you find a connection between that geometry and the geometry in Revit using Rhino inside. Um, so in this case, I've already got an export that I did, so I might just um, import that. So one thing that's really good about Rhino as well, which is probably the first thing I used it for, is this program can read so many different file types. I mean, all the supported file types are here. Um, it's just a few. So like it, it can work with so many different data types and put them all into a common environment as well. Um, it can read things like DWGs, DXFs. I think it reads IFC. I assume if it doesn't, it probably, no, maybe it doesn't. So someone will probably come and correct me there. I think it reads steps. Yeah, there's a lot of files there. Which I've seen. So there's just a few, yeah. So it can work really well between things like 3D Max, which uses FBX, um, or OBJ. Um, so both of those formats are supported here. So it's great for that. Um, I'm just going to import in this case my my model exported out of Revit. Um, I'm just going to scale it. it. It actually guides you through unit scaling, which is really nice. Not many programs do that. So in this case, if the units are wrong, it actually tells you. Um, but at this point, I have essentially the same model. As an import, obviously these are all meshes, so they're all triangulated in, in their face representation, but that's fine because we're really just using this as analysis geometry. Uh, but if I have a look at this roof, for example, everything's essentially imported by element. So you can see the topography is one element, the, the tree is one element. And one thing I found um, when I first looked at these in Rhino, which was sort of like the, the golden eureka moment where I realized, wait, we've got something here. On the end of each element is its element ID in Revit in square brackets. So this essentially is like the key to connecting these two environments now, because I can check the element ID of the elements in the Revit model and also the ones in Rhino and say, okay, what is that element in Revit? And then pass all this data across to, to Rhino and essentially create a BIM model in Rhino um, with, with you know, very few clicks involved. I'm just gonna clean these things up. These are the, these are the lights on my bridge. For some reason they don't, they don't export properly sometimes. I'm just gonna get rid of those. <laughs> you didn't see that. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so um, so this this script isn't it's not too complex. It's got a few steps, um, but essentially I'm using a package called Elefront uh, to send attributes across to this geometry that already exists. So I'm going to give them properties or parameters, 
and essentially feed them values so they know what they are. I'm also going to generate layers in Rhino by category and Revit and then move all the elements to the right layers by category. So my walls are going to be on the wall layer, my windows are going to be in the window layer. So it's going to give me a good way to manage my model as well, because currently everything is just on like a default layer. So I don't really have any, any way to identify anything in an intelligent way. So first of all, I've, I've already collected all the geometry in my model, I believe. So I might just do a recompute. There we go. We just called on 1300 elements in Rhino. Um, didn't even see the spin, so it's very quick. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is rename all these elements because currently their name isn't really great. We've got a lot of characters in front of an element ID and it's not always the same number of characters. So instead, I'm just going to go and isolate these using a little bit of a, a, just a little algorithm that breaks up the string and it takes the last thing it can find before a square bracket. And then we're going to use that to rename the element in Rhino. So I have a, a quick question from a yeah, sure. scholar uh, DX uh, who asks, can Rhino read the point cloud? Yes, I believe it can. Um, just see if it's in the list of files. I guess I, you probably need one of the, oh, there we go. I think E57, I think that might be a point cloud file format. Um, and there's a there's a points format. I don't know if that's a point cloud file format though. I think XYZ might be a, a very raw point cloud format you can obtain, but I'm pretty sure that E57 is a point cloud format type. So I expect you can uh, based on that. Um, I know PTS is probably a more common type. I know if you have RC, RCP or RCS files, I don't think it works with those because they're quite proprietary. Um, they're usually like a converted format from a, from a raw format in Revit. Um, but I believe that probably E57, assuming that, assuming that works, um, that might be, the, might be the bet. You might need to talk to your server and see if they can give you an E57 export out of their program they use. Um, I'm pretty sure most of them can do that. So I think you probably can. And, and I know from there you can probably go and call on all the points very quickly in Rhino and somehow figure out what shapes are based on machine learning and all sorts of crazy things like that. Um, sure. So yeah, there's and, probably some probably some good workflows there. I, I don't know anyone that solved it yet, so it must be hard. <laughs> um, so everyone's still trying to beat that field. So. And Matt out. says, also has to be my favorite live conversation because of the awesome accents. So it's, we, yeah, we have a Australian accent with French yeah. Canadian accent. <laughs> <laughs> we definitely have, yeah, very different accents, but um. But I have actually, I've been over to Canada before, and I must say that we're very similar cultures. We, we, we yeah. both like to have a lot of fun in our yeah, countries. Yeah, sure. I must say, I felt very at home when I was there. I went to Toronto, and, I, and I, everyone there was just like a kindred spirit. We, we all got along. We yeah, sure. had the same we're jokes, kind, had the same ideas. Kind of same yeah, I really size, love, um, the, I, I love the classic Canadian dry sense of humor. It appeals to mm -hmm. me a lot. Like, like uh, I know that there's, everyone likes doing the like this, like not, and that sort of stuff. And I just, it, it just resonated with me, so... Uh, even if we have different accents, we're probably very similar people. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, and also, uh, you know, Quebec and French. Uh, yeah, yeah. In part yeah, is um, its own little thing, too. So, I don't really have uh, have much French. Uh, as you'd say, I guess my French is, is met. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, so it's one of the only words I know. So the, just looking at, at the time, do you think we can, uh, yeah. if we have oh, about, about 10 yeah, minutes, yeah, can, if I we have about 10 minutes, is, is that enough? Yeah, I think um, I can probably breeze through those right. in probably right. about 10 minutes. Right. So, so what I'm going to do now is just send all my geometry from Rhino into Grasshopper, and I'm going to go and check its its properties. So in this case, I'm looking for its name, which is now the same as an element ID in Revit. Um, and, and again, the script is on my GitHub, so I won't dive into the script too deeply. Uh, but this is probably my favorite part of the script. It's going to go and create a layer for every category and give it a random color. So keep an eye on the layers tab. So three, two, one, bang. So now we have a layer in Rhino for every category in Revit. Everything's still sitting on the default layer. So now I'm going to go and check the category of the element back in Revit using Rhino inside and put it on the right layer in Rhino. So this is a really quick part of the script. Um, if I just hit this button, bang, model by category. <laughs> so now everything's on the right layer. So the topography knows it's topography. The planting knows it's planting. The roof should know it's a roof. Um, based on the layer it's sitting on. And finally, I can go and check a whole bunch of data from Revit using Rhino inside and put it into the elements in Rhino. So I'm going to hit this button. And now if I check out my roof, I'll have a little set of tabs here. And I can see now I know my category, my family, the element ID, the type of the element. So I have data inside Rhino. So essentially, I have a Revit model inside Rhino at this point. Um, so it's pretty powerful. Um, this is usually the workflow that I use to classify a Rhino model. Obviously, it's a lot slower if you're doing a massive tower. So you have to be a little bit more selective with what you import sometimes in the case of those models. Um, in this case, this model, you know, I, I could have done this just by smashing the buttons in about five seconds. 
um, but I guess I wanted to run you through step by step what each step was there. But I'm, I'm using a lot of Grasshopper, but I am using some Rhino inside here and there. Um, for example, here I'm having a look at the element type, and then I'm just checking the name of the type, and I'm taking all these properties and making a big list out of them to create attributes to bake into the elements. So these are actually those pieces of data that I'm pushing inside the elements, but I'm using Rhino inside to check what that data actually is. Um, probably like the most important part of the script is actually matching the element IDs, um, which I think I'm doing over here. So I'm taking all the elements in the active Revit view that I can see right now. I'm checking their ID in Revit, but I'm also getting the name of the elements in Rhino. And I'm using a node called find similar member. And this says, if I get, give it a big list of elements and I give it a set of data, it says where in that set of data does that occur? And it gives me what's called an index, which says I'm going to tell you the exact position in this list, which also lines up to the original elements as well. So I can actually use this to line up my Revit elements to my Rhino elements. Um, it's a really common method we use in just computational design and visual coding quite often in trying to get lists to be in the same order as each other based on common properties. So it's um, that's pretty much the key to that part of the workflow. But now that I have all this Revit data, I can actually take advantage of it. So I'm going to open up the second part because we're doing a sun study. So we obviously don't want to think about our windows. Our windows are in the way of the sun. They're still phys physically obstructing the model. So already, um, as soon as I open this script, essentially what this model does is it says, I'm going to pick a category, windows. I'm going to pick a parameter that I want to filter by. Um, in this case, I might just pick a family. And then I have a list of things I can pick from. And these are all my families in the Revit model. So if I pick this one by one window, I've actually went and selected all the one by one windows inside Rhino. So it's still reading the properties out of Revit um, in this case to find the matching element. But because I have all this data available, it's really just searching for my native Rhino data now. And right at the end of the script, it just goes and runs a little bit of Python to select the element. I'm just going to delete them. Usually I would put them on another layer that I'm going to leave out of my study. But for now, I'm just going to delete them so that we move a bit faster. So I'm going to delete all my windows. I'm going to go take my doors. And in this case, I'm just going to go by family. I'm going to delete uh, my curtain doors. So obviously, if you're in a firm where your workflow is very standardized, you wouldn't need to do this. You'd probably just have a script that does it automatically because you know what your family is going to be called or what data you're looking for. Uh, but I've just built like a little toolbox here. So in this case, note that I'm going by curtain panel family and I'm saying system panel here. So this isn't very useful. This is pretty much every single curtain panel in the project. If I change this to type, now I see different sets of parameters from the Rhino model. So there's some really interesting components that Rhino Inside offers us for viewing data as well. In this case, I'm just being shown a big list of all the data that's possible uh, from a list. So in this case, I'm just going to delete my glazed curtain panels. Now my model is open and pretty much ready. I think I've missed, missed one of my windows. So this is essentially just like a selection toolkit um, that I've built using, using Rhino Inside. There we go. OK, so once we've done that, now I'm going to bring in the rooms. And we're going to bake these across using Rhino inside. So we're going to bring these across as a more um, workable geometry class. In this case, we've been working with meshes, which aren't that workable because they have triangulated faces, but they're very efficient and lightweight compared to um, solids and surfaces. But I'm going to bring in my rooms as surfaces. So I'm just getting them out of Revit, um, getting their preview geometry, and just filtering them down to get their, their base surface. What I might do is just turn off all these layers. And I'm actually going and getting the bottom of each room. And I'm just going to bake them in using the Elephant package. And again, I'm baking them across with some data, like their element ID, their name, their number. So these rooms do know what they are back in Revit. So if I do things to these rooms and I get a study based on them, I can still line this up back to uh, a script at the end where I'm going to push some data back to Revit as well and find the matching room that I want to give that data back to. So finally, we're going to run an, a ladybug study at the end. Now, at the moment, these, these rooms aren't really that workable from a ladybug perspective. So what I'll do is just show you what I mean. So if I generate a bunch of test points, uh, I think using a point grid, because essentially we're going to break our, our floors into like sampling points. We obviously can't infinitely test a floor. We need to pick a certain number of points to test for some. Uh, we're going to be using a test grid to do this. But firstly, I'm just going to collect one of these floors. And I know that they've fixed this to some degree in newer versions of Ladybug, so um, don't freak out if, if, if you already know this. Um, I, I know as well. Um, and I'm just, in this case, going to just probably show you how it divides it. So what it does is it turns it into a mesh inside Ladybug, uh, I believe. 
and then it tries to find each face that it can divide as equally as possible. But you can see around the edges, it gets pretty, it gets pretty nasty. So we, if we were going to do a sampling study and actually treat each of these as like one square meter, it wouldn't be very accurate because you get a lot of bias around these sort of corners where the points get pretty bunched up. So what I've done is built an algorithm that essentially redivides the rooms up into cellular divisions instead, and we bake them in as a mesh. So these are like the analysis rooms, as we'd call them. And these are the rooms we're going to force Ladybug to analyze on a very fixed basis. So I'm just going to bake these in. And now if I just go back to my testing script from before, and I'll just turn off my rooms, and I just take in a mesh instead. And I check this one. Now we're sampling on a much more even basis. So when we do our sun study in Ladybug, this is how it's going to analyze this particular element. Um, if anyone does know Ladybug quite well, one limitation of what I've done here is no matter what you tell the sampling to be, it's always just going to do the center of each face. So we've already pre-sampled the floor, essentially, um, if that makes sense to the, the more advanced users. But finally, we're actually going to run a proper Ladybug study. Now, these are usually quite complex scripts. If I zoom out, you'll see there's quite a bit of stuff going on. This is pretty much all Ladybug in yellow. So what it's going to do is build up like a set of um, a set of sun vectors for a particular day of the year. Uh, I don't know if I can see the... Yeah, there we go. So you can see the, the sun path. This is all being done by Ladybug for us and checking various vectors of the sun at certain times of the day uh, at a particular time of the year. Um, you can build like as many vectors as you want to test. Um, we use like a time range. So at the moment I'm testing on June 22nd from nine to three uh, at a time step of 15 minutes. So I should be generating 36 vectors for each point for each floor. And I'm gonna check how much sun each of those receives. So essentially Ladybug is gonna check when those vectors clash with something physical because they know in that case, the sun is obstructed at that particular time. Uh, but most of this is done by Ladybug for us. So firstly, I'm just gonna go and collect all my layers. Uh, I'm using Lunchbox to do this, so I'm just picking everything except for my rooms, and this is my context. This is the physical obstruction to the study, and then I'm also just going to be taking my analysis rooms. These are what we're testing, so I'm going to be calling on all the geometry on these layers. So I'm just going to be referencing the layers, and this will give me all the geometry to test with. Um, and I'm taking this forward to the Ladybug study, and I'm testing this geometry against this context. I've also rotated my model using Rhino inside um, to get the true north rotation as well. So I am testing at the right orientation because you can see at the moment the model faces up in Rhino. So that would be incorrect, but I've sort of fixed that. So now we're just going to run our ladybug study. So I'm just going to click on the run ladybug and this is going to run the entire solar study for me. Um, it, it can take a little while depending on how much you're testing. In this case, it probably takes about 10 seconds. And what this has done is basically tested how much sun each of these points is receiving. So if something's more blue, it means it's getting less sun, usually closer to zero. So this is how many hours of those testing points were successful. Um, and if it's closer to yellow or warmer, um, in this case, it's closer to being compliant. Do you in this case, the, I'm going to say that I only... Oh, sorry, you go. Yeah, yeah. Do you get some units with that? Is that... What, what is it? Is it a number of lux or a candela? Oh, or? no. So in this case, it's just truly, um, are you getting direct sunlight? So it's just a okay. pass or a fail in this case. Oh, um, okay, you okay. can do daylighting. So daylighting is another option in mm -hmm. Honeybee, which is another portion of the Ladybug package. It's, it's much more complicated. Mm -hmm. um, and I believe that one can deal with various um, various uh, luminance lux, lux ratings as well. Mm -hmm. um, and it also can test for things like thermal thermal heat loads and radiance. Um, so it's pretty pretty impressive just what these tools can do. But, but it's a, that probably needs its own its own video to run through. It's a very honeybees a very complex thing compared to ladybug, and, and this is already probably looking quite complex as it is, I'm sure. <laughs> sure. So, um, but in this case, uh, you go. Yep. So do you got a, a few more things on this particular strip, or are we? Yeah. Could so we start to wrap I'm this up? just going to push it back into Revit yeah, at sure, this point. So. Sure. Um, I've essentially just went and determined which cells achieve at least two hours. And then I'm just checking, um, in this case, what, what, how much sun each room actually receives in terms of compliant area. So what I'm going to do is push this data back to the rooms based on this. So if I go to one of my floor plans, probably I've only got one thing after this, which is just showing a Revit family from that feasibility study. And then I'm, then I'm pretty much through it. Um, so I've just set up a color scheme based on a parameter. In this case, I've just used the length parameter. So if this goes over two hours, um, the room complies. Actually, I think that's over X square meters of compliance. I think I, I think in this case, I'm just saying if it has any amount of square meterage that does receive two hours of sun, it just complies. Um, so I've done this using a color scheme in Revit. 
So essentially, I'm just saying it has to be at least at least two in this case. I'm saying or less than two is non-compliant. But I'm just going to send the data back to Revit at this point, and this should just tell the rooms how many square meters of compliance they receive. Um, I could set it all the way back down to zero just to just to purely say I only care if it receives any sun. But I can see now that some of these rooms pass, some of them fail, and this was all done using Rhino Inside and Ladybug to inform that. That okay, outcome. so, so um, the return in Revit is just pass or fail depending on the room. Yeah, so essentially, um, in this case, I'm just I'm setting a threshold of two square meters, but I could go to the color scheme, and I think I could just say um, less than apparently at point zero one or something quite small, and this just means the room has to receive at least like some direct sun during the day. It has to at least receive uh, two hours of sunlight um, at some point during the day. Um, there, there are more stringent testing requirements that we usually have to meet, which require more complex algorithms. Um, this is probably like an oversimplified testing requirement, but it's still a requirement that would be very hard to determine um, accurately using like a different tool. Um, I don't believe something like Insight would easily be able to give you that control. And, um, is, and is your script something that you, you could just bring in, you know, uh, and basically press play and get this kind of data? So basically how much input does the user have to do? Yeah, as long as they follow those steps through the other scripts where things are put on particular layers, mm -hmm. um, because for example, here I'm filtering things based on layer names. So I'm taking everything except for like something on say analysis rooms. So as long as the floors are built in a very particular way. So remember how I sort of broke those rooms into more equal distribution um, by breaking them up into cells. So some of those steps are quite important. But um, what we do where I work currently on subconsoling basis is we do actually package these into more uh, particular scripts. There's, there's a guy that I work with who's like an environmental guru and also a grasshopper guru, and he essentially builds like user interfaces to hide hide the script. Hopefully, he's watching this because he's a he's a great guy. Um, but he um he, he's like the master of user interfaces as well. So yeah. he's essentially hiding grasshopper behind it um, in the version that we use there. So it's pretty cool. There's a package called Human UI. There's a guy called Andrew Human who's really big. He's like sort of like the John Pearson of grasshopper. Mm -hmm. um, essentially, um, he's sort of moved on to other things now. Uh, but he set up a lot of the really useful packages we use, and one of them is like data shapes with Dynamo. But it's like it's like data shapes on on steroids. Okay. It, it can do pretty crazy user interfaces, and you can do nested panels, dockable panels, um, and and Grasshopper is sort of like it's more like running all the time, unlike Dynamo. Mm -hmm. Dynamo, you sort of you, you run the script, it's done. Whereas Grasshopper is more like fluidly running all the time. So the same with the user interfaces, they actually. They're like interactable. You can keep changing things in the UIs as well. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that, that's pretty much, I guess, one example. Um, I'll try really quickly just to breeze through the next one because I know you're probably getting close on time, right? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, how are we going we're, for time? I don't want to. Uh, well, we're 30 minutes uh, uh, overboard, but we've uh, got a, a few <laughs> more minutes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right. So in this case, I'm just going to open up a base family and this base family already has a lot of things already built into it. It has some materials, some object styles based on the, the layers that I assigned to some of those elements in my feasibility study. Um, so things like commercial, plant, podium, residential as object styles and also the same thing as materials. And I'm going to bake in that geometry from Rhino to Revit as a family and I'm going to classify all those pieces of the building with object styles and materials so that we have graphical control in Revit as well. Um, so in this case, um, I'm just going to get back into Rhino inside. And I've had to do a few things here, so I probably will build a tutorial for this because um, it's a little bit different to my usual workflow. Um, so in this case, I'm just going to open up a template in millimeters. I'm just going to close all these scripts. And I've just built a script to essentially build a family using Rhino inside. I've only really started learning about this part of Rhino inside recently. Uh, but it's pretty cool. It definitely offers a lot of potential. So I'm going to use this push mass into family script. And essentially, if I open up my, my outcome model from before, so it forms to bake. So this is essentially one of those studies that I just ran with two options in it. Um, I'm going to be referencing these, these by layer. So in this case, I can see I can pick between option one or option two. And I should get on um, different geometry in this case. I'm moving it to the origin as well, so that when it comes into Revit, it's on the origin. Um, but I can essentially build this geometry for import. So I'm sourcing those and moving them closer. Um, I'm also taking the subcategories from Revit as well. So this is why I need them available. And I'm matching the materials as well by name. So if something is residential on a layer in here, it's also going to be that in that in um, Revit when it builds the family as well. 
At this point, I'm just sourcing a, I'm grabbing a family template and essentially just telling it to build a new family based on some form that I'm building with various sets of properties. For example, I've got the geometry, I've got the subcategory and I've got the material for each piece. And I'm just gonna build a family. And this was much quicker than I thought it would. It almost runs instantaneously. So if I go down to family, generic models, it should just go and build me. It should go and build me something. There we go. And now we have a Revit family and it contains um, essentially the geometry classified the right way from our Rhino study. So if you're just trying to get something in for quick documentation whilst in like a feasibility stage of a project, this is pretty paramount so that you can really quickly just give something to Revit that it can cut through and represent accurately. Um, but it means you don't have to worry about managing all the levels in Revit and doing mass floors and some of those techniques that just don't really suit um, the, the rapid change management at that stage. So. So just an example of how you can get some meaningful geometry back into into Revit as well, mm -hmm. as well as just you know pushing out to Rhino and sending data back as well. So it's it, there's so much more you can do with these tools, but I guess hopefully I've shown a few a few use cases, and um, this will probably become a tutorial on my channel quite soon. So I probably won't put this one on GitHub yet, cool. um, but everything else is pretty much available. Yeah, in tutorials and, and there was a question yeah. from Matt that asked, did I miss it, or can Gavin give his GitHub link before the end of the evening? Oh, yeah. He's got uh, sure. a lot of great work that he's offering. Yeah, so um, github.com slash aussiebimguru. Um, and I break it down by scripts and files. So Dynamo scripts, Grasshopper scripts, and Revit files. And then a few random things in the miscellaneous section. So um, most stuff I put on YouTube comes straight on here as well. Um, and and you know, from there, you're pretty much welcome to do whatever you want with it. Um, essentially, I, I put it out in the open and you know let, let people have a play with it, use it in their company. Um, don't blame me if it breaks anything. Um, make sure you test it first, but but otherwise, um, hopefully it helps you uh, save some time as well. Because I know not everyone has time to follow along with me for half an hour and you know build build it the way I do. <clears throat> yeah. So so, uh, guess, um, so for somebody, what would be the first step for somebody who wants to learn Grasshopper or Rhino? Do you, should yep. they start with your channel or? Do you know a good no, resource for not. beginners? <laughs> okay, okay. So if you want to start with Grasshopper, uh, go to the Grasshopper homepage. I think you might have to look up Grasshopper 3D so that you don't get pictures of grasshoppers. <laughs> like I just did. Um, just like if you look up Dynamo, you get pictures of the magician Dynamo. <laughs> he's, he's optimized his SEO algorithm to he's beat Dynamo magician? forever. I don't, I don't know who that is. Yeah, if you look up oh, okay. Dynamo, um, he's, he, it's just him. He wins. Oh, okay. <laughs> so he, he, right. he got better SEO than Autodesk did. <laughs> um, but in this case, there should be a beginner series. I might even just search for it here um, just because their website's pretty big. And it should be David Rutten's beginner series. And this will just get you started with Grasshopper. Yeah, just tutorials mm -hmm. for Grasshopper. And this was where I actually started. Um, it's I think it's like an eight-part series. There's also a big pamphlet. So I guess like you do pamphlets. They, they, they oh, he yeah, has pamphlets well. too. Okay. Yeah, I think there's a few templates in here they, they use. Um, it's all public open source. They recommend Ladybug. Some of this stuff's a little bit out of date, so um, you know, read between the lines on it. But in this case, there's a there's a tutorial series um, that I started with, which is this one here, Introduction to Grasshopper. And through about eight videos, they just introduce you to the fundamental concepts of building nodes, connecting things together, and they're creating using, a very basic tunnel. And they're using Rhino with the uh, Grasshopper. Yes. Okay. And yeah, do, so in this do, case, they're doing most of the geometry generation inside Grasshopper and then baking it into Rhino at the end, I think. Um, okay. But probably, and should you start yeah. with Grasshopper or with Rhino? Um, I would recommend spending a little bit of time in Rhino. It mm -hmm. depends on what you want to use it for. Um, the biggest mistake people can make is to start with Rhino and go straight to Ladybug tools because that's yeah. quite a complex um, set of tools. And whilst you can learn Ladybug on its own if you try hard enough, you won't really understand how to get data into a workable format. So like, for example, how I process those surfaces to be more readable by Ladybug. Um, Ladybug doesn't do that for you necessarily. So you do need some understanding on dealing just with the basic geometry classes in Rhino. So essentially um, meshes and what we call B-reps or boundary representations, which are like surfaces and solids. Um, definitely learn the difference between them first and how you can transform data from one to the other, how you can turn points into lines, into surfaces. And so focus on building up form because you'll be doing a lot of reconstructing and deconstructing of shapes and forms in Grasshopper as well in a lot of workflows. And then from there, you can sort of build onto the more complex skills as you become more comfortable with the with the fundamentals. Um, but this series here will give you a lot of the geometric fundamentals. Um, from there, there's another really great resource who has a YouTube channel um, called, I think it's called Parametric House. 
Um, I've used a lot of his tutorials when I was still learning. Yeah, there we are. Um, and I think his channel's called Rhino Grasshopper, but he essentially is, um, he's got his own paid website as well if, if you want to just pay for some Rhino quick Grasshopper. learning. But he has some really okay. cool geometrically focused tutorials and he goes through step by step as well, which is great. Um, so I would definitely recommend checking him out. And then maybe at some point you might want to come to my channel and see what yeah, I've got cool. as well because I do have like a dedicated ladybug tutorial. Mm -hmm. um, I have a playlist on my channel uh, under Rhino Grasshopper, I think. Um, I wish these stayed in the same order. So I have one playlist for Rhino um, and I have a two-part ladybug series. Then some, some geometry, like I turn the Mona Lisa into a geometric landscape, some really wacky things sometimes and sometimes some more normal things. Um, like that script where I put myself onto a picture, I've got a tutorial for it. And then I do other things like generative design inside Rhino as well. So I show some of the more complex um, aspects of it. I do like the um, the Albaha facade, that that triangulator facade that can open and close. Mm -hmm. I build that using Revit plus Rhino inside. Mm -hmm. um, so there's there's a few things I, I put like Rhino into an augmented reality environment on my phone, my phone using a tool called Fologram, which is a grasshopper add-in. So I do quite a lot of things, but I've, I, the workflow where I turn the Revit model into a Rhino model, I've got in a tutorial. Um, then how I select them, I sort of broken them down into various steps, and then I've got the, the rooms, the sampling, and the ladybug study. So I've sort of got some of those things captured there. But I would say start with the basics. Um, you'll probably, if, if you follow my channel to begin with, all you'll learn is what I know, which you know obviously isn't, isn't enough for you probably. So um, definitely use my tutorials more as a guide um, and less as just like a, this is everything you need to know or this is where you should begin. Um, I think just begin on your own terms and then you'll find what you want to learn from there. It's usually my advice to people. But, but yeah, the, the beginner series is probably at least the safest place to begin. Also. All right. So WZ in the chat says, I failed my tools and technique class at uh, NJIT architecture school last oh, year because of Grasshopper. Very hard to grasp <laughs> Grasshopper. It's more for programmers, I believe. I think it depends how it's taught. Um, that That's the challenge. I don't want to say your teacher did a bad job. Um, because they might have done a good job and maybe, maybe it was your fault. But, but at the same time, it might have been just that maybe their teaching style didn't capture a way for Grasshopper to make sense to you or to give value to how you work. Um, at the same time, maybe visual programming is not for you. It, it's not for everyone. Um, you know, I, I'm very passionate about programming, but I appreciate that, you know, 80% of the industry probably isn't. Um, so I know it's a, it's a niche interest and a niche skill. Um, I, I do feel that sometimes universities do maybe force it on a little bit hard on students. I will say that. I've seen a lot of courses that get very focused on going way too deep on Grasshopper too fast. Um, sometimes teachers forget that, you know, you can't start with like a ladybug study. You have to start with like, this is a box and we're going to break it into six faces and we're going to take the points of the face. And you do, you do fundamental things that make sense to someone who hasn't worked with it before. So may, maybe that might have been why um why it was a challenge um i do encourage you to try to learn it in your own time in your own way um and see if maybe you can find alignment with it um even if your teacher maybe wasn't able to give that to you um because you may be missing out on something that could give you a lot of value and time saving but at the same time don't feel pressured to have to use it if you don't like it or it doesn't work for you it is what it is um but, but just make sure that i guess if you do something like a a sun study eventually just remember that this is available um if, if you do want to build yourself up to that point um but but don't let it discourage you i guess from from just trying other programs and you know finding the ones that work for you as well okay so uh, anything else you, you want to show anything else you were you're um, working on i think i've probably bombarded quite a few examples yeah. on today so um All right. so i guess um maybe if people want um i do have like a beginner series of rhino inside that might help it's a little bit out of date so I, I probably will eventually package this into like a more formal course that I can maintain in real time because like they've changed the user interface quite a lot. They've added new logos to every single tool, but I do have like a five part series where I try mm -hmm. to break down some of those basic steps that I showed, like how you can select elements, filter elements, get their data, set their data. So some of this might still have some value, like creating Revit grids and levels from, from, from a Rhino model. So, so maybe that might give um, some examples that people can, can work with, but I guess just play with it a bit, especially if you're a Dynamo user. If you're using Dynamo and you're not using Grasshopper, um, you're definitely probably missing out to some degree on what you know visual coding could do for you. Um, don't just limit your vision to Dynamo. It's a great tool and it's a great starting point for programmers as well. Um, I love Dynamo. I still use it um, almost every day. Um, but at the same time, you know, be, be receptive to other platforms out there that might fill the gaps on um, things that Revit can't necessarily do too well, especially if you, if you ever do conceptual massing and adaptive components. 
uh, probably try Rhino because you might find you can probably save yourself a little bit of a headache um, in that environment as well. Yeah. So if you have any last question for Gavin, now is the time. So looking at the comments, as Cardiac says, university needs to teach classical architecture built with hands. Uh, paper and pills and pencil should be your first start. Oh, we got one of well, these ones. <laughs> yeah, well, well, we had uh, my first semester in architecture was all by hand. Yeah, yeah. I agree. I agree. You start there, no but definitely computer. don't finish there because the industry is no. not there anymore. Sure. <laughs> uh, J Jacob <laughs> says all visual programming tools need a strong foundation. I don't even recommend beginning with a box, but with data types and computational concepts. Maybe. I, I feel like that's not necessarily a safe starting point for some people because you've got to remember some people don't even know what a data type is. <laughs> they don't even know what data is. Like they know what a wall in Revit is. They know what a door in Revit is. They have no idea what a Revit.db.door.class is. Like they don't understand the, 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 the architecture behind the scenes. Um, I think for a programmer, or if you understand Python or something like that, like for sure, start with data because you already know data. Um, if you don't know data, start with something that you know and find a way for that to give your learning context. Um, but I agree, data types are super important. Computational logic is super important. You do have to learn it earlier rather than later. And also list management. That is like 80% of like the problems I get given inside um, from Aussie BIM Guru is related to people not knowing how to manage their data and going, I can't get my thing to work the way I want it to. And it's usually list management. So managing the order of data and the structure of data. Um, but to start there, I know I've tried starting people there and it usually fails. Um, so give it a try and see how it goes, I guess. See, see if other people maybe that you know, um, you can teach them and see if it works. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, with that, it was, will be the, the final word. So any final uh, thought for the public or ask for the public? I mean, obviously, thanks for having me on. I've had fun sort of sharing some things that I have, probably haven't shown on the channel before and, and just getting to know you as well. It's great to meet some other BIM tubers out there. If any BIM tubers are watching, like get in touch with us. Like we want mm -hmm. everyone to be more connected. I think that, yeah, that sure. benefits everyone when we're a community and like, you know, I saw that Dynamo, super, not, not Dynamo, the Revit super user thing mm -hmm. the other day. That was awesome. Yeah, when like cool. all these people came together in one place and I was bombarding everyone in the chat. <laughs> so yeah, that, yeah. that was awesome. Um, when, when you have a community, like things just grow so much faster mm -hmm. and, and visual programming is a really great community as well. If you're trying to just get into it, like get in touch with me or someone else that's involved and we'll give you a starting point. Um, we obviously won't give you like free training 24 seven. We have, we have lives as well, but, but I, I do try to do my best to give people like a, a starting point that works for them because I know it's quite intimidating. Um, I know most of what I showed you today probably looked quite intimidating, but remember that this is like a destination rather than a starting point. Um, mm -hmm. so I, I usually like to show people the destination in, in webinars and then the starting point in my tutorials. Um, that way it's sort of more accessible, I guess, for different audiences. Yes. But, Sure, but now uh, too, I like, need to get started yeah. with Rhino and all these tools. Where what what yeah, I find I mean, time, if you're a Revit user, I, I like definitely get into Dynamo first. Is my yeah, advice yeah. to you? Like Dynamo is the place to start because the concepts of programming will be so much easier to mm -hmm. contextualize in Dynamo because you know what a Revit wall is already, whereas you probably don't know what a, a B rep is, for example, in Rhino. So it's like it's almost like if you can avoid learning two things at the same time, mm -hmm. like the concepts of a program plus the programming. Um, and just learn the programming, you'll find that I reckon your learning will really, really take off um, more easily. And uh, a lot of the tutorials I check on my channel are for, for people getting started too now. So hopefully maybe some of those might help you out and yeah, and it'll, it'll save you time too as a consultant. I have um, maybe like 25 scripts I've built just for my business that do like automation tasks. One of them actually automatically files documents based on names. It doesn't actually work in Revit, it just works in Windows. Oh, and okay. it just goes and <laughs> automatically files my emails for me. So, so like oh, there's some really, cool good time-saving tools you can build in there as well once you once you get deeper. Yeah. So, and eventually I'll, I'll be releasing a Dynamo course uh, eventually. It, it, some people have probably known I've been saying this for about six months now that it's coming, it's coming, and <laughs> it just keeps getting pushed back. Um, but I am really trying to commit to it, hopefully within, within the next month or so. Um, that'll be like, I guess, a beginner up to intermediate. Uh, I don't want to say beginner to expert because you can't really teach someone to be an expert just in one course. It's not really possible, um, but it will at least get you pretty much all the tools that you need as an architect to, to understand what this Dynamo thing is all about. All right. Well, looking forward to it. Thanks for being here. That was amazing. Yeah. Now Thank I you. want Thanks to get into it. Me. So bye to everyone and see you next yeah. week with uh, Michael Kilkelly from Art Smarter. We're going to be talking about C Sharp and creating your first uh, Revit add-in. Awesome. So okay. thanks. Bye, everybody.